Hebrews chapter 11. Today we'll be looking at Abraham, uh, again, still in the Hall of Faith. And then Hebrews 11, Abraham's wing of that great Hall of Faith. Greater than, in my opinion, any Hall of Fame that's around today. Uh, of what God, God, the ones that God has used miraculously. We, again, just... We've been going through this Hall of Faith given to us by inspiration in Hebrews 11. So again, we're still in Abraham's wing, which is not, not to be surprising uh, as far as the number of weeks we've spent in this wing. Uh, we're not quite done yet. Uh, in the fact that he is known as the friend of God. Isaiah 41 8 says, but thou, but thou, Israel, art my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. 2 Chronicles 27 states, Art not thou our God, who didst not drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? James 2.23 And the Scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What a testimony. Think through that with me. This man that comes from an idolatrous land, having having many recorded issues that the Scriptures reveal to us. He wasn't perfect, was he? Twice, at least, he, he lied about who his wife was to protect his own hide. He was far from perfect, and he failed... But yet he's known for all time as the friend of God. I know in our culture today there is a push to know who's the greatest. In sports this last few weeks, uh, LeBron James, for some of you that care about those types of things, passed Kareem on the scoring list. And people are trying to call him the greatest of all time basketball player. Uh... Better than Michael Jordan, which to me is a ridiculous argument, but I'm not here to preach on that because I could, I could go on that for a while too. He's not the greatest of all time. But do you think that a person that is known or has the moniker as the friend of God perhaps could be up there in the rankings of one of the greatest men that ever lived? Wouldn't that be awesome? To think about if you could get to that place that God would look at you and say, that's my friend. You don't have to be perfect. Abraham wasn't. But you have to have a faith that is focused on the Savior. This morning we're going to look at the, the event that he is probably most known for. Of all time, the sacrifice of that precious son. Before we dive into that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for recording in your word this event that we'll be looking at, but also showing us a friend of yours, a, a, a man that lived in such a way that while he was not perfect, He still lived a faithful life and became known as a friend of yours. That that it would be this that this concept would, uh, I pray, inspire us to live according to your word, so that we would be able to know that well done, thou good and faithful servant. That we would be able to walk with you, Lord. There are many things that distract us this morning. Many issues going on in this world around us. Many issues in our in our families that are are weighing on us. Lord, there are some here today that are carrying a very heavy burden for different things in their own families. Pray that you would give them rest for a while from those cares, that they would be able to focus in upon you and look to you for their strength and for that encouragement. Lord, I pray as a church family we would continue to grow in our knowledge and our walk with You, but also, Lord, that we would continue to grow in our care for one another, that we would encourage 
admonish, edify one another on a daily basis, and look for how we can bear one another's burdens. Give us a heart that is looking outward. Lord, there are many things in our world today that weigh heavily on our heart as we see a world that is increasingly walking away from You. I pray that You'd give us the, the courage to stand up for truth and that we would have the courage to speak out for Your glory. Lord, now I pray as we come to this passage that Your will would be done, that we would see something here, that Your Spirit would move among us, that each one of us here today would walk out of here with something on our mind, on our hearts, that we need to work on, that we can praise You for, or we can uh, change to be more like You. I beg of You to do a mighty work today in Your precious name. Amen. The first thing we see is a challenge of faith. challenge of faith. Hebrews 11, right, verse 17 in our journey through this, cha- this book. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he, had that, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten Son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 22. As we go through this hall of faith, I'd like to look back at the account that is written out and inspired what was written in Hebrew. Well, God inspired both of it. So I get caught up on that. Genesis 22, starting in verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell of thee. This makes no sense at all. It doesn't. We've been reading through Genesis and over the last few weeks we've been looking at Abraham and there's that constant promise for a seed that would be the seed that God would give that would be uh, through him would be the blessing that the mighty nation would be come out of it and all the world would be blessed through that seed. And here... Uh, Abraham had struggled through keeping looking at that promise. Sarah had, had lost hope many times, and we looked at her a few weeks ago, of, of that promised seed. They had whole, the whole Hagar and Ishmael incident going on, right? Where they tried to subvert God's plan and, and, and fulfill it their own way. And God said, no, it's not Ishmael that's going to be that, that seed. It's not the servant that's already in your home. It's going to be the one I will provide. And a year before uh, Isaac is born, we even have that instance where God comes and speaks with Abraham and Sarah laughs in the tent and God reaffirms His promise that a year from now that child would come. And to think that many, many believe that this Genesis 22 it, it takes place about somewhere between 12 and 13 years after Isaac is born. That doesn't seem significant in some ways, but for me, I look at it and think, here, Abraham longed for this son. He longed for this precious gift. And then finally, he is given that gift of that son, that promised one that would be the heir. And he, t- and he watches this young child work his way from being an infant up to being a young man. A, a, a very, a, a, in their culture, that's about where the manhood almost started. And then he had spent that time, 12 to 13 years, with this child loving on him. For now, God to come and say, Abraham, take him and sacrifice him. That doesn't make sense to me. How cruel by our standards. One of the things I thought through on this, I believe we can learn from it, is an unexamined faith is tenuous. At best. Is it an easy thing to say, I have faith, but is it an entirely different thing to live it out? There are many of us here this morning that have boasted the claim that we have a faith, that God is faithful in His promises to supply all our needs, but we have never actually done anything that takes steps to prove that is true. Well, I believe God will provide for all of my needs. 
Well, do you give to, uh, give unto the Lord sacrificially? Well, you know, I, I make sure I you know write it out of the budget a little bit. Well, I, I I believe God will provide for me, but yet we never take any steps to prove it. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not calling for the kind of foolishness that is often put out there by some people for, in, in your finances. I'm not calling for people to give everything they have and let's trust God. God gives you those things to be a wise steward of them. But how many times have you actually said, you know what, I'm going to take a step beyond what I know I'm comfortable with to give to God and watch what He will do for me. Watch what He will do. Because you see, an untested faith is untrustworthy. There's an old adage, an old, old account that would be that is brought up often of a, someone coming in this morning to this auditorium and putting a gun to your head and saying, "Recant God or die." And of course, we all sit here smuggling. Oh yeah, I would, I would die. Until that 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 uh, that uh, slide is racked and, you're, and the, the, it's being pressed into your head. Will you really do it? We don't really know until it actually happens. Yet the evidence of the multitude of other situations that test our commitment to, to, to Christ speak volumes, does it not? We would sit, we sit here oftentimes and say, I would never recant God. They come in and they can shoot me. Okay, speak to somebody about the Lord. Well, you know, I really don't want to do that. Well, prove your faith by, by, by walking and, 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 talk, and living it out to the people around you. Well, yeah, someone might make fun of me. So you will die, but you won't be laughed at. Does that make sense? An untested faith is untrustworthy. You don't really know you have it until you've actually gone out and lived by that faith. I can say all kinds of things, but if, I, if I'm not willing to back it up, is it true? It's when we put the test of faith, of James 1, 3, holiness, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. That patience or courage or perseverance that is found in a daily commitment to live out our faith. When we've put it to the test and we've taken stands that are unpopular because we believe they're based on the Word of God and we've gone against the family and loved ones because we're going to follow Christ and we continue on through it. That, pain, that, that, that t- trying of your faith will work that courage, that endurance, that patience. You can see what you have is genuine and real. What we see here, though, in Genesis 22 also, though, another component of this trial that I believe is important is that, lay, that God was laying down for His friend is that He was giving Abraham a love check. That statement in verse 2 of Genesis 22 where it says, Whom thou lovest. Is it indicated that Abraham naturally had a deep passion for this son of promise? We don't blame him. He loved him deeply. But we need to remember that we serve a jealous God that does not share loyalties with others. Exodus 34.14 Thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Did you get that? His name is jealous. He does not share loyalties. Deuteronomy 4.24 For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The divine preeminence is nothing to fool with. He will be worshipped, and those that feel that they can add Him to while maintaining other people or things as exalted as Him is surely fooling themselves. He, Abraham is looking at this son that he loves. He loves deeply. And God says, do you love him more than me? Are you willing to sacrifice him for me even though you love him and I gave him to you? How many times in our own lives are we, we faced with those kind of uh, trials? That if I'm going to show forth that I love God above all else, it's going to have to be lived out. Mark 10 constantly comes back to my mind of that rich young ruler. He was super religious by his own standards and by the standards of men around him. He was a good man by everybody's standard and, was, and it would have been an excellent addition to the group of disciples. Hey, throw in a rich guy. You go to a Baptist, convention, Baptist a pastor's thing and you say, well, there's this, this millionaire that's looking to join a church. You'll find a bunch of guys falling all over him. And, and making all kinds of acquiescence to whatever he wants. 
But Jesus wasn't like that, was He? Jesus said, Jesus beholding Him, loved Him, and said, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, so whatsoever thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross, and follow Me. And He was sad at that saying, He went His way grieved, for He had great possessions. What did the rich young ruler love more than God? His finances, His riches. And in essence, Abraham, or God, Jesus is doing the same thing to the rich young ruler here that He did to Abraham in the Old Testament and saying, give up your most precious commodity, the thing you cherish most in this world. Will you give it up for Me? Abraham loved God greater than his possession. Christian, do you? Is God preeminent in your life? First place over everything else you possibly could have. If He's not, you're an idolater. Because if God isn't first, you are an idolatry. The next thing we see, though, in this account is the courage of faith. Verse 3, the courage of faith. Continue on. That Old Testament account of Abraham rose up early and saddled his ass and took his two, two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood of the burnt offering and rose up and went to the place that God had told him. Perhaps I'm alone here in this, but I am probably a very... No, I know. I shouldn't hedge that one. I am a world-class procrastinator. I can look at all kinds of things. I sit down to work on a sermon sometimes. And I'm like, well, I should check this out real quick. And I should look at this. Oh, I should return this email. Well, you know, that person I need to make a phone call to. You know, this thing, I need to look at that. You know, that, that somebody asked me a question about that. I should dive into that study. And I'll study that out for a couple hours. And I look at the clock. I'm like, I've got to go drive a bus. I didn't get to what I was supposed to do. And I am very good at procrastinating what I need to do. I love studying. Don't get me wrong. Don't think I'm saying I don't love to study for my messages. And I do. But I also can throw all kinds of things in before I actually get to that study. Every distraction, every possibility is research before I have to get to the serious task that at hand. And trust me, if I was Abraham and I would have received this command, I would have taken the time to research the best route to get there, check the traffic, look at the weather conditions, figure out the best places to stop on each day because it'll be a three-day journey. And, you know, maybe I'll get to it sometime. Because I do not want to do what I'm being called to do. But not Abraham. For Abraham, we see immediate obedience. <laughs> this, this, that phrase there, for he rose up early in the morning. He didn't mess around. God had given him command, and the next morning he woke up early and got going. God's commands are to be followed in obedience, and our obedience to His commands is a direct reflection to the value and respect we have to the One that gave it to us. You demonstrate your value of God, what you think of God, by how you obey Him. A careless approach communicates a very low opinion of God while it is true that we have a long-suffering master, that we should not, uh, master, we should not endeavor to take advantage of that, because he is a holy, just God that is jealous, as we looked at. Your delay, my delays in adhering to the commands of God, is nothing more than disobedience. The saying that I was raised up with was to delay is to disobey. When we are given commands of God, it's not something, I'm going to get around to that eventually. I may chance, perhaps get busy about that. We are to do it and do it now. Abraham got up early and set out to offer his son, even though that's a far greater challenge than any, anything that we've been given to do. But he took God seriously and he went out and he obeyed it. And he not only obeyed it immediately, but Abraham obeyed it completely. Verse 6, And Abraham took the wood for the bur of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they both went them together. He took the command seriously enough that he took everything he needed to accomplish the attack without hesitation. 
Again, there are many of us here would have received this order and conveniently would have forgotten to take the wood. Oh, man, I left the wood at home. I guess we've got to go back. I don't have a knife. Can't slay him. Oh, we forgot to bring fire, and I'm not good enough at rubbing the two sticks, so we've got to go back. But Abraham took everything he needed to accomplish what God had given him to do, and it was completely ready to go through it. There are some that have... There are some here that would try to take the foolish, idiotic sentiment of, well, if God truly wants me to do this, then He will provide for those details. The lunacy of trying to play games with, a, with our obedience to God and looking for loops, holes, and everything is why many of us do not know a relationship with the Master that is possible to us. Well, if God wants me to witness, then I'll do that. If God wants me to do this, then He will provide divinely for this. When God tells us to do something, we are to do it. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Here's a command. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You notice the conditions on that? What if the person that, is in my, in, 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 that I'm, I'm being taught this to, in, in, I don't really like them. What if they're not very lovable? What if that person has treated me wrong? What if, they're, what if they, they don't deserve my care? Where's the condition on the command that says, okay, if they're just not a lovable person, you don't have to do it. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. And what is amazing is that little phrase right here, as I have loved you. That is a high mark to follow. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet what? Sinners. Christ died for us. While you were still a dirty, filthy, stinking, rotten sinner, cherishing the sins of the world around you, doing what God, things that were opposed to God, He loved you enough to send His Son to die for you. Even though you were unlovable as I was unlovable. There was no connections on it, no commands on no conditions on it. It's a simple command. Love one another. I'm not to simply step back and say, well, if they've earned my love, if they've deserved my love, no, I'm a servant of the Master and I am to obey Him. And that means I am to love each and every one of you in here. Love my brothers in the Lord no matter what because it's not about them. It's about my obedience to Him. But so often we want to put it off and say, you know, eh. we don't com- obey completely. The thing is, people, conditional re- submission is rebellion. Conditional submission is rebellion. Unfortunately, far too many of us are, are taking a Gideon's fleece approach to everything instead of copying Abraham's uh, immediate submission to whatever God has called us to do. Remember Gideon? Put the fleece out. Then I'll put the police out again. People want to take that and use that as a as a tried and true method of how God wants us to handle things. No. That's not how it is. God gives us a command, we go and do it. We don't sit there and say, Well, you know, Lord, if you want me to love that person, then you better make them wear a red shirt today. What foolishness. I'm to love them regardless. When we place conditions on our obedience, we are in effect telling the Creator, Sustainer, Sovereign of the universe that He is not worthy of our allegiance unless He will stoop down and meet some ridiculous bidding of ours to prove how important He is. Can you imagine the ridiculousness of that? Yes, God, I know You told me to do this, but if You will do my bidding, you pathetic little peon, God is not yours to manipulate or to control. He is yours to obey and to do it completely. I don't manipulate God because God created me and I am His to do what He pleases. God is not some puppet that we can sit there and manipulate around. But also we see here in Abraham an enduring obedience. That verse 4 gets me every time. 
Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Ever try to take a band-aid off slowly just so it wouldn't hurt? Doesn't work, does it? And he started to peel it off and, oh, oh. okay, wait for later. Ah, no. Grab it. Rip it. Yes. Ah. Okay, now I'm good. When it comes to things about pain that each one of us have to go through, most of us in here, I dare say probably all of us, would rather deal with acute pain than chronic pain, right? Acute pain is something that comes on instantly, it hurts, and then it's done with. Once you remove the conditions that are responsible for it, if you get stabbed, it hurts. Right? You, you go to the doctor, they take the knife off, they patch it up, and after a while you feel okay. You have a chronic problem, a chronic disease that is constantly causing you a headache or backache or whatever else it is, and you deal with that day in and day out for years. I dare say you'd rather have that knife and be done with it in a matter of days maybe weeks from the recovery, then suffer for years, right? Here God tells Abraham, offer Isaac. And I could understand a little bit better if Abraham was would have been able to go grab his child, take him to the nearby mountain, put, make the altar, lay him down, and within hours it's done. But to spend three days traveling with your precious son, setting up a campsite, Making s'mores, probably not, but that's in my head. Roasting some hot dogs on the fire. Putting them to, to bed. Getting them up the next day and carrying a private one-on-one time with that son. I can only imagine the twisting in Abraham's heart every day. For three days, knowing I'm going to be killing my son. We need to learn that fleeting obedience is defiance. Someone that says, well, I'll obey God, but yet now I'm done. We are not giving a time frame on our obedience, are we? I love the Isaiah chapter 6 passage. and I've read that and studied and preached it I don't know how many times. It's the throne room of God where Isaiah sees, sees, sees God high and lifted up and God issues out, who will go for me? Who shall we send? Small little detail there. Trinity talked about. Anyways, who will we send? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. I love that passage because we never say God tell him what to do. He simply says, we're looking for a volunteer. We're looking for someone to go. And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Didn't know what what the job was. How many of us here have that kind of commitment to the Lord? Or how many of us here would be like, Okay, Lord, tell me what you want, and I'll see if it kind of fits what I, what I like. But then Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah comes back to me and you. That's the part of the passage I love, because here we see this guy jump up, Lord, send me! But then he comes just back like I am. Verse 11, he says, How long? Lord, I'll obey you! Send me! And he says, go out and preach the gospel to all the world and or to, to tell every creature. And then Isaiah says, well, how long? I'll do it, but you know, let's be reasonable here. And God's response to him says there, to basically to put, to put a barrel paraphrase on it, until there's nobody left to tell. You just keep going. Our obedience to the masters until he calls us home, either through death or the rapture. There's no time frame on this. But we finally see in this passage, this account also is the completion of faith. Genesis 22 again, verse 7. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb, the burnt offering? Put yourself in Abraham's place right there. What would your heart do if your child, you're about to sacrifice him because of God's command, and your child looks to you and says, Where's the offering? I think that would have twisted his heart and his stomach into knots. Remember, Abraham was simply a man like me and you. 
Verse 8, And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. They came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar uh, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay him. Let me back up to verse 9 real quick. Abraham set a pattern in his life of obeying God in obedience. And uh, the thing that gets to me when I look at verse 9 there, so that Abraham put him on the altar and laid, laid, put, put it, the, the wood on the altar, bound Isaac, and laid him on the altar of wood. How old is Abraham? About 100 years old. And a 12 or 13 year old young man can outrun a 100 year old. Could he not? Pretty sure it's going to happen. But we don't see Abraham here having any problem. Isaac obeyed his dad. The importance of teaching our children obedience. Abraham modeled it to his kids. Isaac, I believe, willingly allowed dad to bound him and lay him on the altar. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called on him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thy hand upon the lad, neither do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up of a burnt offering in the stead of his son. What an emotional roller coaster that Abraham had gone through, even though he had complete faith that God was able to raise Isaac from the dead. Perhaps we get too jaded at the events of Scriptures because we, we see the end of the story, right? We know how this all comes out, so we don't need to, you know, to worry about it. But we fail to remember that the heroes of the faith of Hebrews 11 that we'll be looking at over the next few probably months uh, did not see the end of the story when they were called to do what God called them to do. They couldn't jump to the end and see how it worked out. For Abraham, this whole trial was an indication of his justification by works. Abraham laid Isaac on that altar, bound, and raised up that knife, fully intending to drop that night blade into that son. But before anyone tries to jump ahead of me or jump around and say, well, the pastor's teaching a false gospel that people are saved by works, that's not what I said. Additionally, I'm not new in this stand. As a brother of our Lord stated, was not Abraham our father justified by works? So if James can say it by inspiration of the Almighty, I think I can say it too. When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seeing now how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. The great confusion here is often taken from a lack of understanding of what is being addressed. Paul, in, he, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 2 states, For if Abraham were justified by works, he, whereof, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. So Paul says Abraham was, was not justified by works because if he was justified for works, he has nothing to glory of before God. And James says he was justified by works. How does this work out? John Wesley makes a statement. He says he was justified therefore in Paul's sense that is accounted righteous by faith and succeeded to his works. He was justified in James' sense that is made righteous by the works by works consequent to his faith. So that James is justified by works, justification by works is the fruit of Paul's justification by faith. Abraham was justified by works because he had a faith that was genuine, that was displayed. A genuine faith in our Savior is that it will be displayed for those around us. The logical conclusion then here is that if there's no display of faith, that is a natural reason to believe that there is no real faith present. If your life does not, if your works of your life does not demonstrate what you say you believe, you might not believe it in the first place. 
There's nothing to do with some. Uh, this has nothing to do with some kind of attributed of various dogmas. It is simply understanding the realities of faith. If I walk into a field and I see an animal that is black and white, has an udder and moves, I'm not free to call it an eagle because I really like eagles. Boy, I like eagles. I was told this last week where to go fishing and you can have an eagle drop and catch it, take a fish right off the ground next to you. Problem is you need a boat to get there. I don't got a boat. But I'm not free to walk into that field and look at that black and white animal uh, grazing and, and chewing its cut and say, it's an eagle! No, you're an idiot! <laughs> That's right. Good job, Landon. It's a cow! I don't care what I make it out to be. Right? Just like this nonsense of the woke agenda and this transgenderism, a man's a man and a woman's a woman, I don't care what you say you are, that's what you are. Yeah, it's lunacy and foolishness to say it otherwise. For me to call a cow an eagle just because I feel led to do it is it, it, just as much nonsense as any of that other things. And it's the same thing with a person that says, I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but their life doesn't show it. You are unregenerated uh, uh, again, or still, most likely, if you've never, you don't live it out. A genuine believer will have marks of a believer that most likely, unless they're most, unless they are still unregenerated. The one final thing from this passage in Hebrews 11 is a divine provision. Verse 19, back in Hebrews 11. Verse 19, back in Hebrews 11, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, whence also we received him in a figure. What an awesome God we serve. It's one of the reasons why I would ask Brother Case that he would give an example of God miraculously working in his ministry. Because here we have a promise to Abraham that Isaac was that heir that would bring him, bring to that mighty nation fulfillment of the covenant. Abraham did not go to Moriah thinking that God wants me to slay this child. If God wants me to slay this child, no doubt He will replace him. No, replacement wasn't on the altar. Replacement wasn't part of this equation. God had promised that Isaac was that son, and God never fools around with His integrity. When God says something, it's going to happen. Abraham was ready to plunge the knife into his son, take the torch and light the altar and burn up that sacrifice on the Lord, and still believe that God could raise that disemboweled, fried corpse to life because God had promised that He would. God had promised that this is the one that you will have be a mighty nation from. Why would a loving God put the one known as His friend as we looked at through something like this? How could you put your friend through this? The question may be inappropriate because God does not owe us an explanation for anything that He deems to do. But I believe we get a hint of why He would put His friend through this in our verse for the week. That your trial of your faith be much more precious than gold that perishes. Though it be tried with fire, and Abraham was ready to try it with fire, might be found under the praise and honor and the glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. It is through the trials that we actually see the depth of our commitment to the Father and understand the reality of our faith. An illustration that I have often overused, and I know it, but I will again with a twist. I can say I trust a chair to hold me, but until I actually sit in it, I have never demonstrated that faith, have I? But you know what else happens? Once I sit in that, tree, that chair and I demonstrate my faith, I can also grow in my faith as I continue to trust it. I've sat down in chairs before. Okay, hey, I trust it. And yesterday, board meeting, sitting in a folding chair. I hate folding chairs. The whole time I'm sitting, I had to stand up a couple times during the meeting because I had my legs primed it firmly on the ground, ready to stand. At any moment, I felt that chair go. Did I trust it? Mm, kind of. I got a spot I sit at at the house. I sit down, my feet go up. I don't care. I trust it. I, I continue to trust it. 
through every situation. I don't. I, I am fully relaxed, fully reclined into it. And when we trust our Almighty God and we continue in that trust, we literally lift our feet and say, "It's it's you, God, or I'm going to fall." And we go through the trials and we continue with that posture. We see the depth of our faith and we know it is so much more precious than gold. There's a difference between a living and a dead faith. For to Him the Lord receives His highest praise from humble minds and hearts sincere. What all the loud professor says offends the righteous judge's ears. To walk as children of the day, to mark the precepts holy light, to wage the warfare, watch and pray, show who are pleasing in His sight. Not words alone it costs the Lord to purchase pardon for His own, nor will a soul by grace restored return the Savior, return the Savior words alone. With golden bells and priestly vests and rich pomegranates bordered round, the need of holiness expressed and called for fruit as well as sound. Easy indeed it were to reach a mansion in the courts above as swelling words and fluent speech might serve instead of faith and love. But none shall gain that blissful place or God's unclouded glory see who talks of free and sovereign grace unless that grace has made him free indeed. Lord, thank You for Your servant here, Your friend. That You've given us an illustration of one that has committed to You even giving up the most precious thing that He had in His Son to be faithful to what You've commanded Him to do. Lord, forgive us of our idolatry as we continue to hold on to things and the people higher than You. Help us to lay those things down and cling, cherish, embrace You above all else. Lord, I do pray for those here today that are struggling in a spiritual battle with something. That You would give them the grace as they see through this time and comfort and encouragement but also help them to keep focused on You. I pray all of this in Your precious name. Amen.